All right, well, good afternoon. Um, we're going to start today, as we always do, with our, our latest numbers. We've now lost 1,243 Detroiters to COVID-19. Uh, that's six more uh, than we reported yesterday. And while that's uh, a lot smaller than uh, we were seeing not too long ago, it's still far too many. I'm going to start with what I always start with, which is our chart. And here's the question is, are we continuing to drop the deaths uh, week to week? This is the single best measure, whether it's going down or going up. As we ramp up testing, we're going to see more and more positives. That's a good thing. Uh, but uh, can we bring this uh, virus down to the point uh, that our neighbors are, are surviving it? And so, again, I continue to show you, five weeks ago, 284 deaths when we were at the peak uh, of this epidemic. Four weeks ago, it dropped to 221. Three weeks ago, 134. Two weeks ago, we were down to 70. In the last seven days, down to 40. And so we want to just keep dropping it. 50% week after week, uh, and we will continue to move things in the right direction. Testing is uh, critical. Everybody knows how obsessed I am, but today I have a partner with me who has been just as obsessed with it, and he's driven by a personal mission. Uh, but we have started now uh, with our residents over the age of 60, and I will say it again, anybody who lives in the city over the age of 60, you can get tested for free at the fairgrounds. You have to make an appointment. We have had a bunch of people just drive up. Uh, it doesn't work like that. You've got other places in the country where people sit in their car for seven hours waiting for a swab. We don't do that because Quicken has been good enough to set up a call-in center. And so you can get an appointment within 24 or 48 hours. It's not a problem. You can pick the time that's good for you. You can say, I want to be coming Monday between 2 and 3. But please call and make an appointment. Uh, and uh, we're going to do this for those over 60 uh, throughout the rest of next week and then see where we are. But I'm really hopeful that in the not too distant future, we just open this up to every single Detroiter, regardless of age, uh, so that everyone in this city can get tested. Separating the infectious from the non-infectious with testing is the centerpiece. Now, what I ultimately want to build to is a system in this city where you've got a main testing site at the fairgrounds, but you also have a whole series of community sites where you can get tested closer to your home. Mitch Album's done something in Highland Park. Rite Aid Pharmacy's done something in Wyoming. Uh, Dr. Phil Levy uh, has done different pop-ups at Wayne State through the city. Those are all valuable, and we want more of those. But there has been a leader in neighborhood testing uh, who's been just relentless uh, in what it has taken for him to line up test kits and lab results and people to do the swabbing. Uh, it's been remarkable to watch. And I think people in this town know Reverend Horace Sheffield himself, like Chief Craig, who's with us today, <laughs> had to fight off uh, the coronavirus. Uh, they're not under any illusion about how dangerous this is. It is really important that we stop the spread uh, in the city. And so Reverend Sheffield and Debo uh, have started their own series of neighborhood testing sites. It is phenomenally uh, successful in what they're doing. It's what I hope over the next month we see more and more churches and more and more community groups do because that's what we'd like to have is multiple testing sites across the city. And so I asked Reverend Sheffield if he would come here today, talk about his personal experience uh, with COVID-19, but also let Detroiters know about his testing site, what's available, uh, how you can get an appointment to go there. And, and I'm hoping that we have a few other folks in this community who listen to Reverend Sheffield's story and say, I can do that too and start up some testing sites of their own. So with that, uh, Reverend Sheffield. Well, thank you, Mayor. I want to uh, uh, share my appreciation for how uh, testing has evolved, um, knowing that you've made some adjustments to make certain folks could have access to testing who uh, might not have it otherwise. I was in New York uh, against the better judgment of many people uh, to have a meeting with uh, Reverend Sharpton and some of uh, Bloomberg's persons over um, the Greenwood Chamber of Commerce, which you know was bound in 1919. I chaired the board of the, the uh, rehab there. 
And I went, and right after the meeting, I felt so bad. Never felt so bad in my life. Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm in the testing there is because when I got home, most of the testing protocol would not allow me to get a test because I didn't have a fever. Uh, and, and my wife, who's a nurse practitioner, works in the St. Joseph Mercy System, arranged for me to get a test, and I found out that I was positive. Uh, let me just say that I, I want to thank Premier Quality Health Centers that's doing our testing, Platform Health, uh, Demetrius Johnson, the former Detroit Lion, uh, linebacker, and Mike Jones from the NFL uh, have Platform Healthcare. They're providing our testing. We just got a great network of agencies that work with us, Dable Disability Network and the class agency. I also want to give a shout out to my sponsors, and I'm going to go into community testing sites, but 315 Cannabis, DMC Sinai Grace, of course, you're Form affiliation with DMC, DTE Energy, Comerica Bank, Massive Lifestyles, Renaissance Chapter Links, and UAW President Roy Gamble and Mayor Mike Duggan. Um, everything that I've done all along, I've emailed the mayor and made them aware of what I needed to do, and hopefully some of my prodding and pushing will lead to more community sites. So we have basically a few different sites. Uh, Dable Sheffield Center will be testing at DMC Sinai Grace, which is 48235, which has the highest instance and high, highest numbers, Northwest Activity Center, uh, Perfecting Church in Wayne County Community College District. We're averaging about 150 phone calls per day of people interested in getting uh, the testing done. Uh, the testing registration, you call 313-706-2750, 313-706-2750, or email us at testing at dabledetroitinc.com. So, we're glad to be a part of this compendium, this, this platform of care. Uh, testing is so important, people need to know. I'll just leave this little story. A member of my church who works in a public space, going to work every single day, was tested last Tuesday and found out she was positive. Uh, and she had to go back through contact tracing and let people know. We do have an agency, the class agency, who's following up mayor with everyone who tests positive so we can inform them what they need to do, who they need to talk to and follow up uh, on a long-term basis to make certain that they don't test, uh, that other people around them know that they tested positive and have access to testing as well. So the number again, 313-706-2750, 313-706-2750, and just email us at testing at Dable Detroit INC. We're doing testing tomorrow and Sunday, every weekend, and then some days during the week. Uh, tremendous leadership uh, from Reverend Sheffield, and, it, and we are gonna beat COVID-19 as a community uh, with, with leaders like this. Um, we also are bringing back uh, another leader. Uh, so <laughs> in the last uh, few weeks, uh, one of our cabinet officers, Bethany Mellitz, the chief administrative officer, uh, left and it created a vacancy. She was running a lot of departments uh, and I needed to hire somebody uh, to fill that job. Uh, and all I could think about was, uh, who could do the most to help protect Detroiters? And the reality is coronavirus is going to be with us for a long time. We're not going to wait this out in two or three weeks and it's going to be gone. Now we have to figure out how to reopen businesses in this city and do it safely so we don't cause a spike. That's going to take a lot of work in the coming months. Then we'll hit flu season and Dr. Redfield, the head of the CDC, right. has already indicated that when December and Feb through February comes up in the regular flu season, we could have a COVID-19 spike that's more severe than what we experienced here in March and April. And when you think about the deadly effect on the African-American community, I just thought, uh, I want somebody uh, who's qualified to protect the health of Detroiters, ideally somebody who would lead our, our COVID-19 response uh, for the next year. And as I started to think about it, to my mind, there was only one candidate. Uh, and Conrad Mallett was at the Detroit Medical Center before I was. Uh, but in my first year in 2014, the DMC board all but ordered me to close Sinai Grace Hospital. It was losing 40 or $50 million a year. It had a great deal of problems, and they wanted it shut down. And I got the board to give me six months. And Conrad Mallett went in as the president. He had been in the corporate offices. And I sat with the leadership of that hospital. And I said, everything has to change. The culture has to change. The professionalism has to change. The cleanliness has to change. Uh, and you're either going to back new leadership 
uh, or I'm not going to have any choice. And what I watched happen was remarkable. Uh, I saw somebody who was a son of Detroit go into the last hospital on Detroit's west side and say, we're not going to lose this hospital for this community. The quality of the care improved, the timeliness of the response improved, the pride uh, in the hospital improved, to the point where about five years later, uh, Conrad was offered the head of a hospital system out in California and a lot more money than I was paying him, and he took the job, and I congratulated him. <laughs> the next day, half the doctors at Sinai Grace were in my office, and they were yelling at me, saying, you have to, uh, you can't let him go. You have to make him stay. I said, I can't make him stay. He's got a great job offer. They said, we're not out of the woods yet. We need Conrad Ballard here. I said, well, then you need to go uh, tell him how important you are. And after he had publicly announced he was taking the job in California, uh, the doctors and the nurses uh, convinced him to reverse that decision uh, and stay uh, at that hospital. He turned out a lot of money uh, because he cared about this city. He cared about this community. And Sinai Grace would not be there today uh, if it weren't for Conrad Mallet. And so as I look over the next year and say, uh, who do we need in leadership? Uh, you, when you're talking the former Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court, uh, I felt like the only position appropriate uh, would be deputy mayor. He'll be paid exactly the same as Bethany Mellis. is isn't costing us a dollar more uh, than what we uh, were spending and what we had in the budget. Uh, but he's going to function as deputy mayor. He's going to lead the overall effort uh, to deal with COVID-19 going forward, including the health department and the civil rights department and a number of the other operations. Uh, and he's going to start a week from Monday. Uh, and I could not be more pleased to welcome back to uh, the city of Detroit, uh, Conrad Mellon. Conrad? Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. I appreciate it. As some of you know, this is my uh, third go-round, Mr. Mayor, on the 11th floor. Uh, I was there under the legendary uh, Coleman Young as one of his uh, chief executive assistants. I was there during the first 90 days of the Kilpatrick administration. Uh, and now I'm back and could not be more pleased to be back with uh, uh, Mayor Duggan, who was my boss uh, from 04 until uh, 12 at uh, the Detroit Medical Center. Uh, what Mike did at the DMC has been heavily, heavily documented. All of us are aware of the tremendous contribution that he made to that institution. Uh, we all, Mr. Mayor, appreciate deeply the leadership that you provided this great city. Uh, and it's my pleasure and it's my honor uh, to come back to the city of Detroit in an executive uh, capacity. I'm very excited, I'm very pleased, uh, and I just can't tell you how much I'm thankful for the opportunity. Um, and so we're looking forward to having you back. Uh, and uh, my other partner, uh, Chief James Craig, who has been designated and will continue to be designated as Deputy Mayor for Public Safety. He'll keep that title. Uh, and uh, I think most people understand this, but the Deputy Mayor title doesn't mean any more money. Uh, he doesn't have an office in City Hall. But the city charter says uh, that if I am out of town or unavailable uh, to, uh, to do my uh, job, that uh, the mayor can file with the city clerk a designation for somebody to act as the mayor. And I have uh, designated Chief Craig for this reason. Uh, if I'm not able to perform and there's an emergency in the city, uh, the police chief, uh, Chief Craig, is the person whose judgment I trust the most, the person who ought to be in charge here uh, during a crisis if I'm not here. And so Chief Craig will remain designated to the city clerk as deputy mayor for uh, public safety, and he will exercise the powers and duties of mayor uh, if I'm out of town or unavailable. Uh, and so we will have Conrad driving the overall uh, health response of the city and Chief Craig uh, remaining on the public safety side. Uh, and I think the, uh, the blend of the two is going to leave this city. I mean, this is the question is, how do we best protect Detroiters? And I look at the team that we've got here along with Denise Fair, the health director, and I feel like we've got as fine a team uh, protecting the health and safety of our citizens as you can uh, can find anywhere. And so here to give us an update uh, on how it's going at the police department is Chief Craig. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Mayor, I just want to start by acknowledging you once again 
uh, not only for your leadership, but certainly for the confidence uh, you have shown in me uh, during my time. We've gone through some highs and some lows, uh, but uh, through it, uh, you can't be successful unless you're not part of a successful team, and that's really a direct reflection on your leadership. Uh, Reverend Sheffield, I just want to acknowledge you as a community leader, someone who saw an issue, and both of us like, you know, we're passionate. We're both, I guess we can say, COVID survivors, mm -hmm. and just the passion associated with that uh, and really going out <clears throat> and doing something that's going to really be part of making a difference uh, going forward. And uh, last, congratulations certainly uh, to Conrad. Uh, it'll be, it's great to work with you again. Uh, Thank you, Chief. Certainly I enjoyed our time together when you were on the police commission. And uh, so I look forward to that and whatever we can do together, uh, look forward to it. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, as the mayor indicated, uh, you know, I have the good fortune of talking to police chiefs around the country, uh, usually once a week, to talk about a variety of issues and they all want to know what's going on in, in Detroit. You might remember some three weeks ago, we had as high as uh, 650 members of our department quarantined. And many asked me, said, how are you running a police department? Before you know it, uh, the entire police department is going to be quarantined. We knew what we were doing. We knew that this was about protecting the safety of the men and women out there uh, doing the difficult work, but also protecting our community. And we figured out early on that uh, we were infecting ourselves. So we had to take some measures, very aggressive measures. And I guess looking at my executive and command team, who just did a marvelous job in making sure there was no disruption in service. And I'm deeply humbled and thank you, uh, thankful for that. So when you talk about today's number, uh, when you look at uh, the number of members of our department who tested positive, uh, for the last three days, we were at 313. Interesting, it's our area code, but 313 for the last three days, which clearly shows a, a decline in the number of cases while we've tested the entire department. So as of today, we're at 314, 314 members of this department who have tested positive for COVID. As of today, and this is one of the lowest numbers we've seen since we started testing, 23 members of our department uh, have tested or are still positive for COVID. Of that number, uh, nine are sworn and four are civilian. Quarantine numbers, as you heard me talk about the quarantines, we have total quarantines were 1,152 since we started the quarantine effort. However, today we have 59 members of our department quarantine. Uh, of that number, 48 are sworn and 11 are civilian. So again, we're continuing to move in the right direction. Uh, and then when you talk about those who have been returned to duty, uh, from those who were placed off duty through quarantines, positive COVID, we had a total of 1,091 return to duty. Sworn, 869 civilian, 222. And so all great news, and I'll tell you another piece of great news as I close out my remarks. You know, when we look at the number of officers that have been in the hospital for COVID, uh, these were serious cases. Many of them uh, were either on oxygen or a ventilator, uh, some very grave cases. Uh, at one point, we had as many as 13 of our members in the hospital. As of today, we have one member, a civilian member of this department, one that remains in the hospital uh, for COVID. So that's a, a, a big deal. So what we've done is we broke out the tier one, certainly tier one members of our department are those who are in hospitals. We created a tier two. Those are the uh, members that have been released from the hospital, but are certainly in recovery, significant recovery. And right now, uh, we have 11 uh, that are at home recovering uh, who were released from the hospital. So very excited to see uh, how well the department is doing in reducing those numbers. But again, I got to give credit in a couple of places, certainly the mayor going out and uh, our acquisition of the rapid testing certainly did wonders of not only returning our officers, 
but identifying those officers that uh, have COVID. Uh, also, just the, the rigor associated with the uh, safety precautions. I'm talking about the PPEs that are worn in the field by our officers. Uh, the fact that when you walk into a police station, every police officer coming on and off duty gets their temperature checked. As I reported out, I think a couple of weeks ago, I went to visit, I visited all the precincts. Every time I've gone to the precinct, coming in, they check my temperature. Coming out, they check the temperature. So what we're doing is working uh, and certainly a model uh, for the country. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, and with that, our health director, Denise Fair. Thank you, Mayor. And let me personally welcome uh, Conrad Mallett. So glad to work with you. Um, I also like to thank uh, Reverend Sheffield for your partnership and helping to further downward uh, the, the trend of COVID-19 in our community. So today as our update, we now have 10,259 confirmed cases and 1,243 deaths. Um, each loss of life to this virus is not only a loss to their families, but also to our community, and we mourn with you. The health department, we continue our mitigation strategy for the seniors um, in our community, and we are shifting focus, as I mentioned on Wednesday, um, we're shifting focus to the, senior, the seniors who are living in apartment buildings. Um, we have 70 facilities that have confirmed COVID-19 cases, and we are beginning to test there. Um, so far, we have tested 1,000 residents in about 17 facilities, and we're still seeing an infection rate of about 2%. Now, testing is still ongoing. The results are continuing to come in. So I imagine these, uh, uh, the data may fluctuate just by a little bit. But our goal is to make sure that anyone who needs to be tested for COVID-19 gets tested. We have 23 additional facilities scheduled between now and the end of this month. We're also, um, as we go to the apartments, we're not only providing them with education, but we're also encouraging them to complete the census as well. Um, starting next week, we are gathering information for all of the seniors. We'll be able to distribute PPE to every uh, senior living in the, uh, the senior <coughs> facilities, including masks, gloves, and hand sanitizers. Now, this effort could not be made possible without our partners from Henry Ford and our city first responders, uh, the Detroit Fire and EMS. They've really stepped up, and I really continue to appreciate their efforts. Um, so I encourage all residents to continue our um, precautions because this virus has not left us yet. So please keep wearing your mask. You may even feel extremely healthy, but you could be a carrier. So please wear your mask, make sure you're covering both your nose and your mouth, wash your hands on a regular basis, wash with soap and water or with a uh, hand sanitizer, practice social distancing, and please stay at home only going out when necessary. We can beat this, we are beating this, and let's just stay focused. And so with that, I'll turn it over to the mayor. And with that, we'll take any questions. Good afternoon, uh, ML Elric, Detroit Free Press. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm here to report they did not take your advice in Lansing yesterday. So, <laughs> no, at least but we all... uh, Denise, I think you and I are outnumbered by the COVID-19 survivors today. Yeah, well, we all got a shower, so maybe, uh, maybe everybody went home cleaner, if not smarter. Um, uh, Ms. Fair, you, you talked about the, um, the testing and the PPE in the homes. Um, in terms of... Uh, in terms of the amount of time to cover all of those, how long do you think it will be to get through all those? And is there a point at which uh, there's a new area that you're going to send your team out to? Or is it a matter of going back and retesting some of the places, like the nursing homes where you were before? Sure, thanks for the question. So it's going to take us approximately five weeks. So we're looking at middle of June. Um, to get to all of the 8,000 seniors. Now, we may miss a few because the seniors may not be at home, so we'll go back to make sure that we test everyone. Okay. And uh, Reverend Sheffield, and, and I guess this may be for Ms. Fair as well, when you have results for your tests, do those all go into one central registry so that if we have a site testing here and a site testing there, somebody knows whether how many Detroiters or Michiganders have been tested? Well, at this point, I hope we'll have more collaboration. We have our own testing results that we didn't uh, share. I've done some testing with Dr. Levy, so um, we probably do need to, although I, let me just say, I do know when people test positive, we right. do report it to the health department. So ultimately they would get those results, but we do the notification of those that we test. 
Right. All positives from all sources go to one central state database. Yeah. Okay, and in terms of figuring out how many people have been tested, whether positive or nev negative, is there any way to capture that data, or is it really up to the testing center, the pharmacy, whoever is handling you, that? You would have to ask each hospital, each doctor's office, each testing uh, center, but um, those who have tested negative are, are not really, uh, I guess you could take a look at the state's overall number and subtract it, uh, but we're more interested in tracking the positives and keeping them uh, away from uh, uh, from their neighbors, and that's really what the state system is designed to do. Okay, so the, the, the negative tests don't necessarily get reported to the, I, I assume the cities do. Okay. I mean, the, the, the state knows how many there were. I don't, I'm sure they don't have individual names in the, in the same way. Okay, um, and uh, Chief Craig, uh, given the, uh, the difficulties of social distancing, and turnover in, De in the Detroit Police Department. Are there, is, is there anything you can do or anything the department envisions <clears throat> to try and get an academy class or to help train the next uh, wave of police officers as people retire? Because obviously it's, it's tough to do some of that training when you can't put your hands on somebody. Right, ML, uh, that, that's a great question. Um, uh, the good news this week, we reopened our academy. Uh, we have three classes that we suspended the training for a time. At the beginning of the pandemic, uh, certainly, we had a lot of concerns. Uh, when you look at the school system, we wanted to make sure we were being responsive. So we temporarily stopped the academy. The academy is up and running. And some other bit of good news, uh, MCOs, it certifies our new classes and uh, certainly certifies when there's a graduation. Uh, they've agreed uh, to work with us. Uh, so we are prepped to move forward and start not only hiring, but uh, new classes coming forth. So we're shooting for the end or the beginning of the next month uh, with a brand new class. The, the other thing that uh, we've been watching very closely during the pandemic, uh, our attrition rate has slowed. Mm. Um, mm. And, uh, I don't have any real good response to you because of it, but it has slowed. Now, we know that January and July tend to be our big months in terms of the number of people who uh, retire, but absent the retirements, uh, people just leaving to go to other agencies. It's really slow. Okay. And so but, we but we're recruiting and hiring right now for the Detroit Police Department. Okay. Uh, how do people Absolutely. take advantage of that opportunity? Uh, you can go through the website. Uh, I don't have the number uh, handy right now, but uh, we are aggressively reaching out and touching candidates. So website, Facebook, um, yeah. Okay. And our goal is 40 people a month all year entering the academy, uh, and that's what they're recruiting to, and they've set up a combination of the uh, distance learning, uh, and it's been fascinating to watch as they've retooled the elements of the training uh, in a way that's appropriate, but uh, we do need to continue uh, to recruit and fill police officers, and for those who may have lost their job someplace else and always felt there was uh, a cop inside them, now's a good time to apply. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, the FDA has, has put out some new, uh, uh, I'm just going to say, documentation on the, on the Abbott uh, rapid testing. It's been getting a lot of discussion. You've been very resolute that you're confident that they're accurate. Uh, have you reviewed this new oh. information, and does it do anything to change your, your feeling that these tests are, in fact, as reliable as we hope they are? Uh, no, I have track everything every day on all tests, uh, and if you talk to any doctor or nurse at the hospitals, uh, they will tell you uh, about the false negatives that occurred in the hospital labs. Uh, COVID-19 <coughs> is so new that none of the testing is perfect. And so we've done probably 30,000 tests using bioreference in New Jersey out of the fairgrounds, two or 3,000 using Garja Labs in Jackson, and about 8,000 uh, using the Abbott 15-minute tests. And we track every one of these uh, and the results. Uh, and uh, we are very confident uh, of Abbott because of our own experience. As Chief Craig said, uh, four or five weeks ago, we had 600 officers quarantined at the Detroit Police Department. We started sending all the exposed officers through the 15-minute uh, Abbott test to sort the infectious and the non-infectious, and the infection rate at the department dropped uh, like that. 
Of the 8,000 that we have tested on Abbott, more than 4,000 are either police, fire, or DDOT. Now, this is why we have confidence. If you have 200 police officers uh, get tested at Abbott and on a Monday and say four are positive, we get them medical care, and the others are negative, they show up for work on Tuesday. First thing that happens, their temperature's taken, they're checked for symptoms. They show up for work on Wednesday. Temperature's checked, they look for symptoms. If we had had the Abbott test not be working, we would have known instantly when people started showing up on Tuesday or Wednesday and said, I just got cleared, how can I be sick? We have found uh, just the opposite. And I think we talked before, Dr. Rahman sent 50 negative results to the state lab. Uh, because there were suggestions that there could be uh, false negatives. The state lab didn't find a single positive uh, out of those uh, 50 tests. And so based on our experience, with 8,000 of these where we see our own employees being checked every day, I get tested on the Abbott 15-minute test. Uh, Denise Fair gets tested on the Abbott 15-minute test. Uh, uh, Dr. Dunn, our medical director, has his own tests on the Abbott 15-minute test. We're basing this on our own experience, our own observation, and I guess, uh, Chief Craig, at this point, I think every member of your department has probably been tested on the Abbott 50 Minute. How do your officers feel as far as confidence in the test? Oh, they have tremendous, and I'm, I'm glad you uh, tossed it to me because I wanted to also, and I, I read that article, one, it wasn't peer-reviewed, and I think there were 100 samples they were looking at, but if you just look at just nothing else but the police department, I think that says it all. I mean, we have seen a, a, a drastic decline. And you know, the, the thing that's most insidious about this disease is that the asymptomatics, the folks that are walking around who are infecting others, and so we're being proactive. Our officers are going in. We've, we've literally tested the entire department. And as other infections rise, then we'll go in and do some additional tests. But in terms of confidence level, they're extremely confident. So we're going to continue to review every bit of science and every test, but based on our own experience, if I had to choose to get tested tomorrow, which I may, I would go in for the Abbott 15 minute test myself. Okay. Um, in terms of the uh, deputy mayor position, um, and, and welcome back, uh, Deputy Mayor Mallet. Um, <laughs> hey, um, Mel, it's good to see you. <laughs> the, uh, the city traditionally has had at most one deputy mayor, sometimes no deputy mayors. Now we'll have two. Uh, city employees are, are giving back some money. Uh, we have budget adjustments. Uh, how do you justify the expense of another deputy mayor at this time? Yeah. yeah, I would not have done anything if it added any expense. And we, we had two deputy mayors when Carol O'Clericon was here my first couple years as a deputy mayor uh, on the finance side as well as Ike McKinnon uh, who worked as a deputy mayor. Uh, but we're doing this in a way, my first priority is protect Detroiters. And given uh, the uh, risk that the African American community has from this virus. First question is how do we best protect Detroiters? Second is how do we make sure we don't increase the budget deficit? And so Conrad Mallet is going in at the exact same salary as the person who left. There is no increase, even though it's a different title. It's no dollar increase. And Chief Craig does not get a single dollar uh, for the deputy mayor title. So we haven't added a dollar to the budget. I wouldn't have done that, but we have in my mind, if you think about and the responsibility I feel to the people of this city every day, uh, the right person leading the health response and the right person leading the public safety response, and we did it by spending no more money. I think people uh, should feel like, I don't, I don't know if there's another mayor in the country who's run a hospital system. Then you add the fact that our chief operating officer, Hakeem Berry, came out of a hospital system. Now you've got a deputy mayor who was for 10 years a hospital president. Uh, I don't think there's a city in America, and there may not be a state in America, uh, with that kind of health uh, care experience in their uh, political leadership. And the people of Detroit will judge us based on how well we protect them uh, from the coronavirus going forward. And does the designation, as opposed to making him a group executive or a chief, whatever office you want to call it, does the deputy mayor uh, designation mean that if something should happen to you and Chief Craig, God forbid, no. that... that Mr. Uh, Mallet would step in. So, so the way the charter works uh, is that uh, from a legal standpoint, the mayor files a document with the city clerk and says you can designate one of your staff 
to exercise the powers and duties of mayor if you are disabled or out of town. Uh, and so Chief Craig has had that document. When Chief Craig uh, was off with coronavirus, I switched that to Eric Jones, the commissioner of the fire department, who uh, I, I was the person I was most confident leading the city if we had a public safety emergency, if something happened to me. And at that point, everybody was worried about going on a ventilator on coronavirus. I had to be thinking about the city. Once Chief Craig healed, uh, I switched the designation back to him. If Chief Craig were to go away again, I would switch that designation back to Commissioner Jones. So the designation of the city clerk is a very simple designation. In the event of an emergency, the mayor is not available. Who do you want running the city? I will always want uh, a public safety official to be that person who's designated. Um, and uh, if you were to go see the city clerk right now, you would see the document that's on file that says Chief Craig is the person designated. It doesn't allow me to have a batting order of multiple people. Mm -hmm. There's only one person that can be designated, and it's Chief Craig. So what should Detroiters take from the significance of the deputy mayor title as opposed to some other I, title? I would say uh, that somebody who has been a chief justice of the Supreme Court and a hospital president uh, uh, deserves the stature of a deputy mayor title. And I think as far as coordinating the overall response, whether he is meeting with Denise Fair and the health department who will report to him, whether he's meeting with the business community who we're going to have to bring back online in a safe way in the coming weeks, uh, or whether he's dealing with the philanthropic community to help raise money, uh, I want them to know uh, that he has a stature of deputy mayor. And uh, I think that does add some weight to the position. And I think given the magnitude of the coronavirus crisis, I wanted the person leading the effort to have the designation deputy mayor. I thought it was, I, I think this crisis is important enough, it, it justifies that designation. Okay, and, and Mr. Mallett, um, is this move back to the city in any way predicated to your position at, uh, at tenant where, I mean, uh, could you stay there if you want? Did you plan to stay there? Did you contact the mayor? Did the mayor contact oh. you? Yeah, the, the, uh, ML, the mayor reached out to me. Yeah, the, the, listen, I'm a longtime employee at the Detroit Medical Center. Uh, I've had a fantastic career there. I said this morning uh, at the cabinet meeting that the, uh, my sister, Veronica, is applying to be the president of the, uh, executive vice president of the University of New Mexico's medical school slash uh, health affairs department. And in the second line of her uh, letter of uh, interest, she describes herself and says, my brother and sister and I have always described ourselves as public servants. Um, my mother and my father were both Detroit public school teachers. And so this is, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is what I have always done. And even when I was at the DMC, I mean, that's, that's, that, that was a private nonprofit, then became an uh, investor-owned uh, health care system. Uh, but we delivered care to uh, one of the most uh, medically fragile communities uh, uh, in the country. Uh, and it was our pleasure, our honor, uh, and our responsibility. It was another form of public service. So this is, this is just a continuation uh, in what myself and my family has always done. Okay, so, so if there are people out there saying, well, Conrad Mallett was looking for a job, you're telling us today you could have continued in your, your your, I guess Absolutely. for now, current position. That's oh. right. Okay. I, went, I went and recruited him, and uh, I think uh, Audrey Gregory is doing a great job at DMC. I, think I she, agree. What we needed there, I think you're going to see that place start to go the right direction, which I don't really think it has been in the last few years. Uh, but uh, this was a case where I went and recruited Conrad and said, uh, we've got a crisis, a health and economic crisis like the city's never seen. We need you back in city government. Okay, and then in terms of the city's drive-through testing site and some of the collaborations with the health systems, we haven't heard DMC or tenant's name come up as much as we have Henry Ford, perhaps Beaumont. Uh, Mr. Mallett, what was your feeling about DMC's uh, uh, effort to rise to the occasion um, to help the city of Detroit get control of this thing? So, I mean, I think that the hospitals operated at their highest and best level, uh, as the mayor indicated. I think Dr. R.G. Gregory has done a phenomenal job leading that institution. And I think, as the mayor indicated, she has a big job on her hands. She's pushing the organization in the right direction. Uh, and the DMC is always going to be ML there for this community. Uh, and, and I would defer back to uh, the Detroit Medical Center leadership to talk about uh, their testing effort. 
Uh, that was not part of my responsibility when I was there, so I don't want to misstate or underrepresent. But let's let's be clear on this. DMC has been a partner of the fairgrounds from day one. Oh, they That's have. True. Okay. Uh, so DMC, Henry Ford, and Trinity have been doing that testing from day one. They have never wavered. Beaumont never participated. Okay. It was I, I DMC, yeah. Henry Ford, and Trinity, and I'm pleased to see that Monday Ascension is going to be joining the three of them, so it'll be all four uh, Detroit systems participating together, but DMC has been a, a major contributor. Okay, that, that was my mistake. I apologize for that, and uh, uh, welcome back, Mr. Mount. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor, we have a, a number of questions from reporters all about the Abbott testing, um, and I think one of them has to do with whether or not the, the NYU study uh, corresponds with how Abbott is used in Detroit or not? Again, we, we the NYU study has not been peer reviewed, as uh, the chief mentioned. I didn't realize he was that <laughs> medically sophisticated. Uh, and so we don't know what exactly the methodology was. Uh, what we do know is that the tests that have been done so far said that if you store the swabs in uh, uh, viral uh, medium transport, uh, that they don't work as well, which we have never done. Uh, but we did our own test, and more than that, we now have an experience with 8,000 people. We've tested more than 4,000 of our own employees, and our experience has been uh, that the Abbott tests are catching the sick people uh, and, uh, and that they're not having any significant false negative rates. So, as I say, we're entirely confident I think if you ask the 2,500 members of the Detroit Police Department uh, what their experience is, if we tried to move them off the Abbott test, I think our officers would strongly object. I think they've been extremely pleased at how fast the Abbott 15-minute tests have uh, improved the, uh, the health of that department. Okay, and uh, from Deadline Detroit, uh, they say that some experts they haven't uh, said specifically who have questioned our recent verification of uh, the Abbott test, the 50 that were sent up to the state uh, saying that it was too small of a sample and uh, also used individuals who were tested negative uh, as opposed to those who had tested positive to see if Abbott picked those up and wanted to know if you would comment on that. So let me just say this. There's no question about false positives. So some have suggested that there are people who Abbott test negative who are really positive. There's no reason to verify somebody that Abbott tests positive. Everybody agrees that that's accurate. And so what Dr. Ramon did, she designed this, I didn't. She says, all right, they're claiming that when Abbott says it's negative, they're missing some. She took 50 negative samples, sent them all to the state lab with a completely different methodology. If these claims have been true, you would have expected five or 10 to come back positive and say, hey, the Abbott test missed five or 10, they're really positive. Instead, the state lab didn't find a single one. So uh, I, I understand that the intensity over Abbott has to do with Washington politics. Uh, we are looking at the science of every single testing methodology, and none of them is perfect. Uh, and the way that you collect the swabs, the way that you store the swabs can affect the outcome in addition to the uh, the machines. What I can tell you is this, that the uh, 8,000 people that we have tested, uh, we are getting no indication. We would know by now, with all of our employees who went back to work, if, if the Abbott test was in fact missing a lot of sick people, we would have known that by now. So um, we're going by our own experience. Uh, and we feel good, and I would say this. Dr. Dunn has been the medical director who has led this. He said this morning, I got my test on the Abbott test, and I get it tomorrow uh, on the Abbott test. That's how we feel. Somebody else feels differently and doesn't want to use it. It's okay with me. I'm not, I'm not the marketing uh, director for <laughs> Abbott. Um, but what it meant to the Detroit Police Department to run hundreds of people through and get an instant yes or no whether you're sick, uh, it, it just transformed the operation, I can't even begin to describe what it was like. We had 600 officers on patrol, and the chief and I were trying to figure out if there were going to be enough cars to go out the next day. And then he came down with it. And it, it just looked like everything was going wrong. When those Abbott kits got here and we started testing our officers, uh, that's when everything stabilized, and I will always appreciate it. Okay, and uh, 
one other follow-up from, from Deadline wanting to know, uh, you've generally addressed this, but are we aware of any instances where someone had tested negative with the Abbott and then later turned out to be positive or became symptomatic afterwards? No, in fact, well, I, I'm sure it's happened, although I haven't heard of it, but the only one I've heard of was just the opposite. Uh, we had two officers in the second precinct who had tested negative at a pharmacy drive through site, the next day came down to our Abbott site and both tested positive. Uh, and so we know of a case where Abbott caught uh, ones that were missed by a pharmacy site. Uh, if there's an individual instance where there was a false negative, mathematically every testing system out there is going to have some false negatives, but I'm not aware of any specific cases. Okay, there's uh, also an uh, unrelated question. There was a Detroit resident who was charged today for making threats against Attorney General Nessel, and a uh, gentleman by the name of Robert Tesh in Fox 2. I want to know if you were aware of that or if you had any comments. Chief? I'm not, I'm not aware of that case. Okay. Okay, uh, I think that's the last question for now. I've got some follow-ups from reporters. I'll have to, I think, uh, catch up with them afterwards. All right. Well, thank you very much. And Reverend Sheffield, again, when can they come out to your place? They come out tomorrow, Sunday. We have uh, regular testing dates and sites set up. Just call 313-706-2750, 313-706-2750, testing at DetroitINC.com. Mayor, I'm, I have to say this. The chief and uh, Supreme Court Justice were all cast tape. <laughs> Mission stick together. <laughs> Thank you very much.